So we are going to talk just a little bit about Serum Ventures. So I am an EIR. I've been one since the inception of the program, however many years ago that was. I think about 10. Uh, Sarah Ventures is my day job. We manage about $75 million uh, dollars in venture capital and another 20 some odd billion in venture for our co-investors, so almost a million bucks. We've invested in 70 companies, a little over 70 companies, most of them here in the Midwest, many of them right here in the Champaign, Urbana area. And we also work with portfolio companies on consultative capacity on a variety of topics. Uh, this is our team, myself, Dennis Beard, Rob Schultz, Steve Betts on the West Coast. Uh, many of you have met Dennis and Rob, and as Laura said, uh, the three of us on the left side of the diagram are all part of the EIR program, and we're always happy to meet with you at any stage of your enterprise, from preconception all the way through to you know, you're down the road a couple of years. Uh, the rest of the Sierra team, we're proud to have added a variety of folks along the way. John Giuliani, a U of I alum who now resides in exile in Las Vegas. Uh, Karen O'Connor is based in Chicago and runs our Chicago office. Eric Wilson and Alyssa are both here in uh, Champaign along with uh, the rest of the team. And then we also have some great venture advisors. Chris is in the audience today, Wade, and uh, Brad, Sante, Andrew. Uh, these are folks that provide us technical advice on various portfolio company matters that we're dealing with. All right, with that, um, I, I have dealt a lot in valuation in the context of venture, but in my prior life, I spent 15 years in public accounting, and a big piece of that was doing business valuation, so I was formerly an accredited senior appraiser through the American Society of Appraisers in the business valuation discipline, and uh, also directed the firm-wide business valuation effort for McGladder and Paul, now known as RSM. Uh, after about my 600th business, business valuation project, I decided that I needed to do something different because, uh, you know, this is, this is a complicated topic, but once you iterate it on it several hundred times, are not apt to discover too many more challenges. So I moved on in my career to other things, venture capital being one of them, but I still have a very near and dear place in my heart for this topic. All right, so business valuation is relevant in a variety of situations. We've got uh, just a few of them listed up here. There's a variety more, but uh, as it relates to your startup, obviously raising capital, and at what value should that capital be raised, that's really the focus of this particular workshop today, but the topic of valuation, I'm going to go a little bit beyond that, can apply to a variety of other situations. Stock option plans, for instance, uh, you need to value the business in, under what's called a 409A valuation. A shareholder buyout, so if you have a group of more than one, uh, two or three or four or ten, you may want to establish some type of a valuation formula to do buyouts of one another because not everybody stays with the enterprise for its entirety. And then a sale liquidity event. What type of proceeds might you expect in a sale event? That's where valuation uh, is often uh, very germane uh, to the question, uh, to, the, to the circumstance. So these are some of the circumstances. Uh, there's a variety of other situations uh, where you might want to uh, know what you're doing, or at least to get some very good advice uh, in, in terms of valuation. All right, so what, what is it defined? Um, in the box here, you can see it's using a combination of analytical techniques, methodologies, and common sense. Always have to throw that into the mix. To determine a fair market value of a business enterprise. So that's it in its simplest form. The ultimate uh, test of valuation is, is really in the marketplace, however. So you can use lots of methodologies, but unless those are tested against the marketplace of people actually exchanging dollars for a business, uh, then you really haven't ultimately gotten to true value. So the, the ultimate test really is at what value does an actual transaction take place. And we want to further break that down to say that both the buyer and the seller are completely willing. They're not under compulsion. There isn't sort of a special, special set of circumstances. 
and uh, they ultimately come to an agreement. Now, rarely do you find the transaction where the parties are completely willing, under no compulsion, there's no extenuating circumstances, right? There's always some variety of that in the mix, right? So even actual transactions may not ultimately be fair market value, but they're the closest thing that we have. And then, uh, as I say here, everything else is conjecture, speculation, negotiating, and posturing. Now, it's also important to look at valuation from a particular angle or point of view or perspective. And I've just put two of them here uh, for us to break down a bit. One is the entrepreneur's perspective. The entrepreneur wants to know how much is my company worth? What are the unique, tangible, and intangible assets, otherwise known as value components? Do we have to offer, and what percentage of the business are we willing to give up as a team in exchange for investor capital, right? Those are sort of the relevant questions from an entrepreneur's perspective, and from the investor's perspective, how much should I pay for this particular opportunity? Can I earn an appropriate rate of return, otherwise known as ROI, to justify the risk being taken, is it possible to scale this company to achieve a 10x? So that's often from a venture investor's standpoint. They need to understand if I'm going to invest in your business at a $4 million value today, I need to believe that I can get a $40 million value at some point in the future when we have a liquidity event. Not every company's ultimately going to head toward that 10x, but I have to sort of believe that, and I have to be able to work the math backwards from 40 to believe that 4 million is the proper price at which to invest in your company today. All right, who's on first? Um, and this really has to do with, in a valuation situation, if you're raising capital, really who's making the first move, who's defining the value at which you want the transaction to consummate. Most situations, I'll say that the investor will move first to propose a valuation. This is the most common. It's not true in every case. But often the investor will, because he or she has seen a universe of deals, will say, hey, this is where your particular set of assets and company sort of stack up against the universe uh, of companies, right? So investors will often be the first to present a value, but it's not true in every case. Um, in other situations, I might ask you, hey, if terms haven't been defined and if value hasn't been set, what do you think the value of your enterprise is? Right? You just need to be careful with um, you know, moving in that domain, but no, no problem in having a well-reasoned value determined and having your criteria for why that value is uh, indeed uh, appropriate. Obviously, value is a key point in the negotiation of the funding round, probably the singular most uh, important point, but there are a variety of other uh, terms, and we'll look at those in a second. Um, and then concessions made on valuation may be compensated for or adjusted through other terms, right? So we might be arguing over a half million bucks in value, and you know what? I'll concede it. I'll say it fine. Instead of my version of four and a half, I'll give you five. But here's what I want in some of the special terms surrounding this round. And so I'll kind of make up the difference, so to speak. Right? So this is a little bit of a game that's played between investors and entrepreneurs. Speaking of that, you know, where, where does it fit into the funding scheme of a variety of terms? You can see up here on the, uh, on the slides, uh, there are... Uh, these other critical terms in the situation, the first of those, a liquidation preference, that's often a, a very critical term. That means that the investor gets a priority in the ultimate sale or liquidity event of the company, right? So I might ask for a 1x liquidation. That means I'm going to be guaranteed to get back 1x the amount I put in, assuming there's enough proceeds in the transaction. I'm first in line. That's a 1x. It might be a 2x. I've seen, uh, we saw a proposal a couple of weeks ago where an investment group was asking for a 4x liquidation preference. They were willing to put a million bucks in, but they wanted to be able to take 4 million out 
at an ultimate sale event and wanted to be first in line. That's extremely unusual. Market today is about 1x. Uh, dividends, warrants, a board seat, or what are called board observer rights. That means I have the right to come to your board meeting and be informed of board decisions, but I'm not actually voting. Founder vesting. This is uh, not one that you see terribly often, but maybe you've already founded your company. You already own the shares, and guess what? The investor comes along and asks you to essentially release ownership and have it vest over a period of time. Right? So you may have founded a company. You may own 30% of it. Uh, your co-founders maybe own the balance. But sometimes investors will ask you to, you know, in, in, in essence, suspend your ownership and earn it back over a two to three or four year period of time. We don't see as much of that here in the Midwest, but it's not an uncommon term from coastal venture uh, groups. Uh, protective provisions, these are things that are going to allow me as a minority investor to have certain say even though I don't have a majority position. So you're not going to be able to go get a bank loan for 100000 bucks without me signing off. You're not going to be able to hire a new CEO. You're not going to be able to arbitrarily set your salaries. These are things that are covered under protective provisions. Redemption rights. That just gives me the right to potentially buy my uh, position, have my position bought back. Uh, all right, so the, all these things can be, these are levers and knobs. And so you can see, yeah, valuation is really critical. But if we're going to argue over it and we need to, you know, I need to give a little bit, I can do that because I've got some other ways to ultimately put myself in the right position as the investor. Questions on this? Yes. Um, in terms of liquidation preference and uh, the 1x uh, liquidation yes. preference, um, when it comes to preferred equity, do you see that change or is it still around 1x? It's usually 1x in a preferred round. Okay. There's often a differentiation between what's called participating 1x and non-participating 1x. So non-participating just means the investors get their 1x, they get the better of their 1x or their percentage ownership of the company according to the cap table. A participating, it's sort of a double dip. If there's enough money to go around, I first rake off 1x. So if I put a million bucks into the company, I, I get that back as a preferred investor. And then all the money that's left over gets divvied up to the common and the preferred investors again. So now I get my percentage of the leftover. That's a participating preference. That's not as common anymore. It, it, it still is around in certain situations. Um, so usually we see preferred just getting a straight up 1x non-participating in most of the deals that we're doing today. All right, valuation terminality. These are some of the basics. Pre-money valuation, you hear that term thrown out. That's just the value of everything to date and the, I doubt, uh, the idea of your value going forward. So it's, it's the proposed value at which the transaction is going to happen. But it's called pre-money because the deal hasn't happened yet. The investment has not yet taken place. That's the pre-money. Then there's the investment. That's the dollars that I'm putting into your enterprise to realize the opportunity that we both think is there, right? We're going to become partners in this endeavor going forward. And then finally, the post money is the value after the deal is done. So it's the set of assets and opportunity here. I put in my half million bucks, and then over here I have the post money, which is the combination of the two, illustrated by this simple mathematical equation here. Pre-money valuation is, let's say in this instance, 1.5 million. The investment is a half million, and so the post money is two. Again, simple math. This just means for a half million dollar investment on a million and a half dollar pre-money, what do I own at the end of the transaction? I own 25%. So pre and post, it's fairly important to distinguish these two. Sometimes you're in a conversation talking about valuation. And it isn't terribly clear, well, was that the pre-money or was that the post? And if the round is big, that's a big number, right? Let's say there's a $5 million round that takes place, and the pre-money is $6 million, so the post is 11 There's a significant difference, you know, when we're talking about now, was that the pre or the post? Uh, so the post money now is the, value, the presumed value of the company now moving forward um, into the future. Right? And it's a very relevant data point for the next funding round. Right? We're going to hope that the pre-money of the next funding round is higher 
than the post money of the prior one, right? That's what we all want to see as investors, as entrepreneurs. We want to see these increment up in a positive direction. Now, what about sensitivity? I just have a pretty simple mathematical demonstration of how sensitive valuation is, at, particularly at, let's say, values less than three or four million, right? Which is where we see a lot of the funding rounds occur in pre-seed or seed rounds. You know, we're often talking relatively modest uh, pre-money valuations. Uh, you can see here at a pre-money valuation of 3.4, if I put 600,000 in, um, I, I own 15% of the company, and the post money is four. You go all the way down here, however, and if we're able to negotiate as investors, let's say a sub $2 million pre-money, in this case 1.4, my 600,000 is double the position uh, that it is under a 3.4 million, right? Again, simple math, but it just shows you that particularly at these lower valuation numbers, it's, it's, it's a highly sensitive uh, situation uh, when we're, we're kind of talking numbers in this range. You can kind of see, yeah, changing the pre-money uh, just even slightly can have a pretty significant effect on the position that I have as the investor and that you have left over uh, as the founders of the company when it's all said and done. All right, so let's, let's get down to some real specifics of how does uh, valuation work. And uh, I've got a little bit of an illustration here, uh, sort of tongue-in-cheek a bit, but over on, on the left side of the diagram is a piece of art, if you can call it that, uh, that's you know, somewhat large in size. And over here we have a scientific diagram um, that has something to do with uh, carbon dioxide concentration. But it's just to say that valuation is typically a combination of art and science, and it tends to be more art the earlier stage your enterprise, right? So I can do all sorts of scientific methodologies, discounted cash flow, and um, sales comparables and things of that nature, but the reality is uh, ultimately a startup business tends to be more of, a, of an art than a science. Not to say that we can't create some type of a framework to work within and, and contain the art, right? And, and we're going to talk about that here in a minute. All right, so valuation methodology from a traditional standpoint breaks down into three uh, categories, and then under each of these categories there are multiple methods. Uh, income methodologies, market methodologies, and asset methodologies, right? So from a sort of a uh, textbook approach, most of what we're going to do is going to fall within uh, one of these categories. Sometimes there are hybrid methodologies that sort of you see a crossover between these different categories. Uh, but th these are the three basic categories. By the way, if, if you want a set of these slides, I can email that to you, and I, I think or I can send one uh, over, and you can have it. So if you don't want to try to take copious amounts of notes, um, you know that's uh, that's. Available to you. So let's talk about income methodologies here for a little bit. Um, these are uh, valuing an enterprise based on the future anticipated income streams. And depending on how we define income, uh, you know, that might be cash flow, revenue, etc. There's several measures of income, and we'll, we'll talk about that uh, a, a bit more. But the two most common measures of income are sales revenue, that's sort of a very top line measure of income. And then uh, EBITDA, as you've heard it said, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Those are, uh, that's another measure. That's more of a bottom line, not quite all the way to the bottom, but it's a bottom line measure of income, right? So sales revenue is up here. You might have other measures of income like gross margin. It's kind of right after cost of goods. Uh, you have EBITDA, you have net income, which is after the deduction of depreciation, amortization, income taxes, and interest. Uh, you have EBIT, uh, which is the same as EBITDA without the DA, uh, literally. So there's all these different measures, right? Uh, and the income methodologies typically use history, uh, not true in every case, but in, in most cases, as a baseline predictor of the future. Uh, it typically involves some amount of speculation as to what is going to occur in the future, right? Whether that has to do with top line or bottom line. And you also have to determine some type of a 
rate or multiplier. But let, let's take a look at uh, uh, an illustration here uh, using EBITDA. So in this particular case, I have a company with earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization of $300,000. Right? So this is more, again, kind of a bottom line number, sales revenue minus cost of units minus all the operating expenses come down to this EBITDA number. Now, within this industry, companies are known to sell for a multiple of three to five times EBITDA. And there are databases available that we can go tap that distinguish for particular industries, here's what the EBITDA multiples are, right? So you're going to have to probably consult an accountant or somebody that works in uh, merger and acquisition to get this range. But this is, you know, a common EBITDA range for, say, a small business would be three to five times EBITDA. So the evaluator, the person doing the valuation, says, all right, you know, all things being considered for this particular company, I think they kind of fall in the middle of the range. They're not at the bottom, they're not at the top. I'm going to pick an EBITDA multiplier of four. And so the calculation is relatively straightforward, and that is 300,000 of EBITDA times four, an entity value of 1.2 million. All right, this is the gross entity value before the deduction of any debt that might be hanging around on the balance sheet. But uh, again, this is uh, an EBITDA multiplier. Let's take a look at discounted cash flow. I won't go into all of the vagaries of this one, but DCF is a very common methodology for very established businesses. It is fraught with a bit of peril for very early stage, and that is because DCF uh, counts on a very uh, specific prediction of the future, right? So the EBIT, you know, the prior slide, this is relatively straightforward. This says, hey, you know, historically we've produced about $300,000 of EBITDA. That's kind of what we've done the last couple of years, or maybe it's an average in the last couple of years. Over here under DCF, we're actually projecting explicit cash flows over some period of time, three years, four years, five years, you can see here. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm projecting cash flow. I have a very complicated model maybe behind that. And then I have a 25% discount factor. And so then I have this calculation over here. I have the debt and so on. So it's, it's a complicated methodology. And uh, it is, again, most typically applied to businesses that have some amount of historical uh, trend data available so that we can project the future. Uh, it involves, again, you know, terminal values and, and so on and so forth, but again, probably the most sophisticated of the income methodologies, uh, and again, not, not completely unusable in a startup situation. Uh, I know a couple of uh, startups in this room that are, are using it, for instance, uh, with some of the folks that they're attempting to get capital from. I won't identify who they are. All right. Um, I guess questions on income before we move to market. Any any kind of basic questions? Yes. Well. So I like the EBITDA method, but for a startup, a lot of uh, startups do not have right like revenue yet. And okay. is it typically projecting in five years or three years what the EBITDA looks like? How much discount or NPV or percentage do you normally use uh, for startups? Yeah. So the question is basically, startups don't have EBITDA, right? And so although this method has some simplicity. You know, what only <laughs> do you do? And it, it really isn't terribly applicable, uh, you know, to startups. But what you might do is project, say, a couple of years into the future, because really anything beyond, say, a couple of years is going to be highly speculative. So you might project what you think a couple of years of EBITDA might be, and then use that as your proxy uh, using this methodology. Right, so it's a little, again, a little simpler than probably doing the DCF. But other questions on income methodologies. A real common income methodology, I didn't illustrate it here, is a multiple of revenue. Right, and that's, that's very typical. You hear that software companies sell for some type of a multiple of revenue. On the low end, that might be four or five. On the high end, it might be the teens. Right, an average, very fast growing, Software uh, entity might might well value in a seven to ten times revenue, right? So if they have, uh, let's say, a million dollars of revenue and they're rapidly growing, 
they're going to probably value in that seven to ten to twelve million dollar range, right? That's a multiple of revenue. All right, again, that's very top line measure of income uh, with a multiplier against it. All right, market methodologies. These are value of business based on comparison of your company to those in the market. Uh, it requires access to information on comparable uh, things happening in the marketplace, whether that's the, you know, the stock market itself is obviously valuing companies. You've heard of P-E ratio. Well, that's, that's kind of an EBITDA multiplier, so to speak. It's the price of the company's stock as a ratio to its earnings, right? So that's kind of similar to a income methodology, and that data is published, right? So of all publicly traded companies, you can find their P-E ratio. Uh, it's, it's actually very, very difficult, though, to find comparable data to a startup, right? First of all, the public, uh, you know, the New York Stock Exchange and even the NASDAQ, those companies are much more mature than a, even a series, let's say, C or D stage startup company, let alone, say, a series A or C stage, right? So comparing your company to stock market multiples, eh, probably not so comparable. Uh, what about databases of actual transactions of private companies? So we have access to that. We can look up that within a certain industrial code, companies have been bought and sold, and sometimes you're lucky enough that the data is reported. Uh, the aggregate transaction, for instance, was a reported stat. It's not always common to see a public company report the price that it paid. But now if you could access the underlying data behind uh, Averable situation was probably a little more complicated to do and we won't uh, disclose all of that, but you could then create a ratio of, okay, price of 63 million was the reported number against, you know, either revenues that they had or earnings. Now all of a sudden you have a ratio, you have a comparable ratio that you can apply to your company. Of course, as you apply it, you're going to have to make adjustments, right? How comparable is my company to the transaction that I just referenced? And often, you know, it's, it's pretty tough to get something exactly comparable. All right, let's take a look at uh, an example here. Market methodology example, net revenue of a company is a million six. So again, this is the sales, the net sales revenue after discounts and rebates and refunds. And we go out and we look at publicly traded comparables, and we see that within this particular industry, let's just say uh, this is uh, you know, retail consumer goods. I don't know that for sure. But we see that you know, publicly traded companies are typically pricing at an average of 2.5 uh, times uh, revenue. And this company has a 1.6 million in revenue now. Uh, there's something known as a discount for lack of marketability that I have to apply because publicly traded companies are highly marketable, right? They're, I can buy and sell uh, publicly traded stocks in an instant. Uh, not so true for a, an illiquid, privately held company, but in this case, I can do my calculation of a million six uh, in revenue times the publicly traded comparable of two and a half times. I'm pulling that from a database uh, off the stock exchange. And I'm uh, multiplying, I'm factoring in my discount for lack of marketability to create a semblance of a comparable transaction here. So this is basically saying, in this case, now my entity is worth 2.4 million using this price uh, to sales or price to revenue uh, ratio. All right, so that's one example. Uh, I guess that's all I have on market methodologies. Uh, and again, you can only do so much comparing a, an illiquid uh, startup to the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. You're actually better off going into uh, like a pitch book, you know, is a common platform now that is aggregating data on private company sales, right? So they are tracking uh, what these companies are selling for as a ratio of, of, of revenue, of EBITDA, etc. So again, that's, that's market methodology. Let's look at asset for a minute. And then I am going to talk very specifically about startups here in a minute and how we sort of discern <laughs> across these mobile methodologies what ultimately makes sense. So asset methodologies value a business based on the value of the assets. Uh, relatively straightforward. Common uh, 
methods here, book value, adjusted book value, replacement value, liquidation value. Uh, these can often be used as sort of a floor situation. So we do get into situations in our portfolio where the company's not tracking appropriately, right? And it's, it's struggling, and guess what? We're going to essentially sell the assets. And that's where this particular methodology comes into play. We're going to you know, quantify what each of the categories of assets, both tangible and intangible, and then we're going to hopefully try to get a sale to realize that. It's not terribly meaningful in most operating situations. So most normal operating situations, you don't know, really use asset-based, but they are you know, somewhat useful in these uh, more stressful situations. So here's a, the balance sheet is over here on the left. It's, you know looks fairly similar to what you would see in your QuickBooks. Cash, accounts receivable, inventory, fixed assets, intangible, etc. So you can see the net, that we have the assets worth $775,000 in this particular case, and we have liabilities of, uh, uh, yeah, there we go, $300,000 uh, and $75,000 accounts payable, so total liabilities of three seventy-five. dollars so the net book value of this company is four hundred thousand. Now we're going to do something called the adjusted book value, which says okay, <coughs> book value is one thing, but that's probably not uh, uh, hopefully the, the real value here. Let's let's make some adjustments. Uh, first adjustment we're going to make we're going to write receivables down by forty thousand because that receivables list actually includes some really old receivables that you've not been in, you've been in dispute with the, uh, the customers on. Inventory. Well, inventory is what you pay for it, but the reality is there's probably some obsolete inventory in there, so we're going to write that down by 20000 Fixed assets, on the other hand, maybe they've been depreciated over time. Maybe that involves some real estate uh, or equipment. And now we're going to write up, in this particular case, we're going to say the book value is three hundred, but the real value of those machines, uh, the land, the buildings is more, so we're going to increment up by four hundred thousand uh, bucks to uh, seven hundred. And then, okay, this 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 company has some patents. Uh, you know, maybe they've uh, done some patent prosecution. It's it's a little bit difficult to discern what those are worth, but we think that these patents might be worth you know hundred grand if we went to the market with them. So we're going to go. You know, the, the patents maybe are reflected on the books at zero. Uh, and we're going to write them up by 100. So now, you know, our total assets we've written up from 775 to a million to uh, 15. Uh, liabilities kind of carry over at their same value. And so now the adjusted book value in this case is uh, $440,000 more than what the book said, right? So now, hopefully this 840 is kind of the floor number that I might expect in a distressed sales situation. Not entirely. Uh, if you really want to go that, there's something called the liquidation value, which applies even a little more draconian adjustment here to these numbers. But you kind of get the basic idea of what's happening here in an asset method. Questions on income, market, or asset before we kind of get into our final uh, sort of little segment talking about startups specifically? Yeah. So, a quick question about the patent valuation. How do you value a patent if it's issued in the prosecution of the public action? Very careful. No, it's, it's a tough question. Um, obviously, an issued patent is you know, presumably more valuable. Uh, you'll often have to go to, say, a patent strategy firm that is familiar with the market for patents, right? The buying and selling of patents. And it's going to be widely variable depending on the industry and the specifics of the patent. Uh, obviously, patents that are provisional or that are pending would be worth less. Uh, so there really isn't a formula per se. I mean, we're kind of dealing with the situation in one of our companies right now. They have a portfolio of about three or four patents, and we're trying to kind of get a handle. If we have to liquidate this, what do we think the market might bring? And we're consulting with some outside experts, and we're thinking, okay, you know, maybe we can get as much as uh, you know four or five hundred thousand bucks out of this portfolio of patents. Are very unique technology, but yeah, it's not a simple answer, unfortunately. I wish it was. Uh, sometimes the value is, quite frankly, zero. Um, I know technologists love to believe that their patent portfolios are, you know, worth something, but often the market itself uh, is, is uh, 
bringing back a, a not so desirable answer on that question. All right. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah, that is a typo. <laughs> it is a typo, yeah. Sorry, good, good catch. Uh, that is a typo. A, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's this, this should be, yeah, it's a typo. <laughs> Great question, though. Uh, all right. Asset method of, whoop, here we go. Rules of thumb. In, in every industry, there are often uh, uh, what are called rules of thumb. You know, they differ. They can be somewhat useful. They need to be really tested against the other methodologies. I kind of threw this one up. Uh, some of you are familiar with Guy Kawasaki. Uh, his law of pre-money valuation is for each engineer you add 500,000 and each MBA you subtract 250. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. <laughs> there you go. I, really, I think you guys, you guys would like that. All right, how about valuing the tech startup? All right, so now we're going to kind of drill down here. Uh, traditional valuation methodologies are difficult. Doesn't mean they can't be used. All right, you can use them with adjustments and an understanding of what needs to be tweaked. Uh, there's often no revenue or EBITDA metrics. There's often insufficient history. There really aren't comparables in the truest sense of the word. And income and cash flow projections are somewhat suspect. Right? All right, so that's, that's what we're playing with, but the reality is uh, you can use some of these methodologies, and I've, I've actually created this template. It works fairly well, um, and this is for a pre-revenue, pre-EBITDA company, okay? And it's, uh, it, it has four uh, factors over here. The most important in my mind is the team, uh, but that's up for debate, uh, depending on who you're talking to. Is the opportunity in the market large scale? And has there been demonstrated customer need and interest? Is the technology disruptive? Is it novel? Uh, is there appropriate freedom to operate, for instance? And then under the last one, the various risk components, the intangible nature of the enterprise. And then you rate it from zero to five. I've got a little more sophisticated model that actually weights the rate, the, 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 the ranking, but in this particular case, just trying to go for simplicity. So you would assign from zero to five on each of these four, and then the range over here, kind of from zero to five. So this basically says in a pre-revenue, uh, pre-EBITDA opportunity, sort of your maximum values in the sort of the $2 million range, uh, the lower end of the threshold is zero, so somewhere between zero and two million. Um, and this is sort of a relative scale, right? So as the market kind of shows us what these companies are actually getting funded at, uh, these ranges may change. I would say this, this range is still, it's relatively close, but these numbers have been bumping up over the last couple of years. So the, the, the real range might be as high as a million dollars in, in these uh, cases, but I like using 500 because I'm an investor, right? So it suits my purposes to, uh, Somewhat kidding, but uh, but not really. <laughs> so yeah, you may actually have a value range from say zero to a million in these four, which means uh, you know the range of relative value is somewhere between zero and four million for a pre-revenue. But then, yeah, the reality is most uh, pre-revenue, pre-EBITDA uh, opportunities, uh, unless there's some really extenuating circumstances, are going to you know they're going to value somewhere in that million five to three three and a half million dollar. Range, right? This is still fairly consistent with what we're seeing. Of course, this, this is more of a Midwestern uh, model. Um, on the coasts, you know, you're seeing uh, numbers outside of this. But uh, questions on this kind of this basic construct? Again, this is a starting point for you know coming up with a number and then negotiating toward uh, you know, the actual result that you may use in the, in the process. Yes, John. Would it be common in the course of negotiations about potential investment to pull something like this out and actually <laughs> kind of break down these pieces to sort of collaborate together, or is this sort of a tool for one side or the other to have in preparation? Yeah, so the question is, you know, would you actually be using this as, say, a tool or a template in the middle of the negotiating process where the parties might be collaborating on it? 
Uh, not terribly common to see that, but I mean, we would welcome it. Uh, it's certainly a tool for either party to be kind of using internally, uh, but yeah, we would not have a problem with that. Uh, absolutely. Maybe. We, we try to be as transparent as possible how we're making our decisions, and we welcome you know, the entrepreneur's input. Okay. Um, that last box, this evaluation of risk, I just want to say, you know, often entrepreneurs aren't terribly in touch with the variety of risks that, that are real, and you are to some extent, but uh, from an investor standpoint, we really do evaluate companies on, okay, what is the technology risk? In other words, has the technology been proven in a commercial setting yet, as opposed to a lab setting or an alpha or a beta? Right? Where is it from a technology standpoint? Financial risk, that just means are you going to be able to attract enough capital to ultimately realize your commercial plan? And let's say your pre-seed or seed, there's pretty high financial risk, right? Because you don't know if you're going to be able to get those rounds done, let alone an A or a B or a C round of funding. Market risk, okay? I heard a pitch yesterday from a company, Chicago-based company, and they presented a matrix to us of kind of where they fit in the competitive landscape. There were three or four publicly traded companies on their matrix who are big time in their space. And then they identified three or four startups similar to themselves, all West Coast funded uh, with big venture money. And, and I sort of took one look at that and I said, man, massive, you know, sort of uh, competitive and slash market risk here. Uh, because of the players that are in the space. So that's uh, kind of this competitive risk, and then execution, you know, can the team actually pull this plan off uh, with the team that they have? There's always going to be some amount of execution. And so if you go back uh, over here, you know, you, you might get a, a lower score if uh, the preponderance of risk seems to be, you know, too heavy. Um, as I said, there's always, this is a starting point. There's always exceptions to this model. Ultimately, supply and demand of funding impacts the range, the combination of the right stuff, ultimately, is uh, what's happening. And, and really, uh, th this is probably a point I, I should have stressed a little bit stronger, and that is, okay, so there's this universe of deals that are happening, right? So I look at an average of 15 deals a week, so roughly 750 over the course of the year, right? So I'm seeing a lot of deals, right? And that universe is sort of conveying various value ranges for the various stages of the companies. And that's ultimately how the value of your enterprise is getting set. It's, a, it's being compared against the universe of, of Series C, Series A, Series Pre-Seed companies that are coming at venture capitalists, and in particular the ones that are getting funded, they're the ones that are sort of setting these ranges. So if you you know, kind of go back to here, this model over time, it kind of moves with the market, right? So in an abundance of, of, of capital, uh, well, these ranges might skew up because there's more capital to fund more opportunities, and when markets tighten a little bit, these sort of screw down a bit because it's a much more competitive landscape. And as I said here, this ultimate test of fair market value is me as the buyer, coming to agreement with you as the seller of your security and the two of us agreeing to a number uh, and all these other terms. And then finally, uh, this is my last slide because I know we're um, short on time. Um, understand that the market for startup capital is ultimately what sets the value. That's kind of what I've just been describing in the last 30 seconds. Be willing and flexible to negotiate. Uh, you don't want to come across to uh, stubborn, of course. Remember that valuation is only one element of a term sheet. It's called a term sheet for a reason, because there's lots of terms. Uh, Alan can help you with that. An overvalued first round can really mess things up. So I, I heard a pitch from a company a couple weeks ago, and they're asking for a roughly $14 million uh, pre-money valuation. They're a company without any revenue. And I just said, you know, you're, you're way off market, you know, with, with this number. And they said, well, the reason we're doing it is because the round that we did two years ago was priced at like eight or nine million, and we've taken on some debt, and, 
And so, sort of mathematically, we have to do this 14 number. I said, well, you know, you sort of violated this rule here, because you were obviously way overvalued in that round you did two years ago. And now, it's sort of the defining metric in why you think you need this much bigger number for a pre-revenue company. And I'm going to tell you, it's not going to work. not going to work for us. You might be able to find another group that it works for. But, um, and I don't have to say this because I'm, I'm an investor. It's, it's really to both parties' benefit. You want to set the right numbers at the right stages so that the story progresses and makes sense for both parties. Yes, there's tension, right? I'm going to, you know, I want to buy low and sell high, and you want to do vice versa. But the reality is there, there is sort of this healthy middle ground that we can come to. And then, yeah, seek professional guidance. One of the things, you know, we're happy to do as EIRs, and, you know, you can tap the universe of EIRs so that you're not just talking to the venture folks in the, in the deal to help you set your value. And so that's kind of the, the prepared remarks, uh, hopefully taking a little bit of the mystery of uh, valuation out of the equation for you. Um, I will say, you know, those traditional methodologies really do become more and more important if you get to the A round, the B round. Uh, we have a situation right now where we're negotiating an A round financing. The company's doing a couple million in revenue, and so we're, we're kind of using one of those, you know, income multipliers. You know, what are companies valuing at as a uh, price against revenue? And so we're kind of calculating that to see, okay, yeah, you're probably you're you know a nine million dollar value. It's probably about right. That's that's roughly a you know a four you know whatever x times sales. That's about where your industry is. So as you progress as a startup, you can start to tap more into those traditional methodologies more so than this more simple matrix I presented, which is more appropriate for the very very first stage. Questions? Yes, sir. So as you said, the, the final test is the you know the after you close the round you get to know the uh, exact amount of the, the stock you know, the, the cost of the stock. But uh, after you close the round, you're actually selling the preferred stock, right? So what is the best way to calculate the value of the common stock? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, the preferred stock, yes, you're selling it for you know X price, and so now you have the post money. Um, and, and what you do to value common stock, obviously, is uh, you're going to have to apply some form of a discount to the value at which the preferred ground just happened. And there is some methodology, it's a little complicated, where you value the various preferences uh, that have been, but it's, it's not uncommon to see discounts from you know, anywhere from 25 to 75% applied against the preferred stock value to get to the net common, uh, particularly if there's liquidation preferences, right, because those can have a tremendous effect. Uh, they, they can actually push the value of common to zero for certain periods of time. Uh, you know, ultimately, the, the values converge. The, the larger the value of the entity becomes, right, so if you ultimately have a $150 million, uh, the, the there's very little disparity now between the preferred price and the common price, right? Uh, there's going to be some, but it's going to be a, a much smaller discount. It might be 5%, might be 10%. Uh, so, yeah, as you progress. But, yeah, there's, there's some actual methodology, but great, great point that uh, what we're really ultimately talking about here is, you know, the value of the, the preferred uh, equity in the company. Yes? So each, each round, you typically have four or five or more investors. Right. So typically, they're one leader in and one leading investor, and they're rest investors. Right. I'm interested in learning what's the behind the curtain. Like, is more about leading investor side all the term, other people just putting money in, or is there a discussion part? Of, okay, how is that the term? Yeah, usually the lead investor. So yeah, Wei Wa's question is, you know, if there's a syndicate, say of multiple investors, let's say there's three or four funds that are coming together, maybe it's a combo of funds and some angel investors, and there's typically a lead who will set the terms. And that group may or may not do it in collaboration with others, Probably, typically not the way it's happening. It's usually, if I'm the lead investor with Serionix, I'm going to negotiate, I'm going to present a term sheet, you guys are going to come back with some changes, 
and we're going to settle it, and then I'm going to go shop the term sheet as the lead investor to my syndicate and say, hey, I've agreed to these terms, um, and take a look and see if you'd like to come into the round. And usually, uh, funds like Sarah will sign off without any problem where you get into some nuances. You have corporate strategic group, uh, uh, venture groups, uh, and they tend to be a little more persnickety about what we want, you know, certain field of use rights for this particular technology in our industry, or we want the right to buy the company, you know, within a, you know, whatever. They all, they, they try to do, you know, a variety of, of uh, different takes. So it's a little more complicated with, with strategics, uh, but yeah, that's kind of the basics of what's happening. You often see in, in the venture land, uh, fewer and fewer firms really want to lead. And, that, and the reason is it's complicated to come up with a term sheet, and you are also responsible for doing most of the diligence, and then you're sharing the diligence with your syndicate. They're still required to do diligence, but it, their job has become much simpler all of a sudden. So I'd say, you know, of the universe of venture capitalists, probably 75% of them don't want to leave and will not leave, right? They will, they will join a syndicate and get on the bandwagon, but they don't want to leave. We're, we're leading in about 40% of our uh, investments. So we don't mind it, but it kind of has to, you have to be cognizant of the work that's involved because it it's a lot more difficult. Uh, yeah, I have a few questions. Uh, one is, uh, you have a few. Huh? Yeah. Well, it is one, so if you do need to leave, you can leave, but go ahead. Oh, okay, sure. So, uh, is there a culture Yes. Right. So if there is a big projection, yeah. okay, the next year will be four million, the next year right. will be eight million. You know, so what will be the boundary? Right. So uh, that's the first question. Yeah, there, there absolutely are the value ranges on the coasts are larger, uh, right? So they're they're going to typically pay a higher price for the same set of assets and the same team. I mean, a little bit of the catch is. They typically want the companies to be on the coast, not true in every case, right? We're seeing more of them come and actually provide funding to uh, Midwest-based companies, but there often are, yeah, very different ranges for how the coastal VCs are calculating appropriate value, yes. And so here, you know, uh, not just Sarah, so yes. I know there are other... Right. You know, so, um, what would be the typical kind of funding range? So, so let's say it's a Series A. Right. So what, what, what's yeah, typical Series A here are you know they're they're kind of three to five million total funding round, and you know the value of the Series A depending on obviously the industry is going to vary. The uh, you know I would say on the low end six seven million uh, for a Series A. Uh, in, for the entity value up into the, say, the lower single digits, 10, 11, 12, that's kind of the Midwestern value range. And it's really just demand and supply because there's an emergence of some really powerful, good quality opportunities in the Midwest because of the ecosystems like have been built here at, at U of I. I mean, this is also happening in Ann Arbor and Kansas City and St. Louis and so forth. So the quality of what's being built and the infrastructure behind it, much, much better than it was 15 or 20 years ago. So that's the good news. The bad news is we still are dramatically underserved in the amount of venture that's available, right? So hence the compression of the ranges and, uh, you know, it's, it's more advantageous to do a deal in the Midwest from the investor standpoint because you know, there just isn't as much capital, right? So that smaller supply forces the ranges to be a little lower. Even though in theory, you know, your company can go tap the, the venture capital on the coast. That's theoretically true. It does pan out in certain cases. You know, you see a, a you know, a Veriflow a company that was founded here uh, that we wanted to invest in and we couldn't because uh, the evil venture capitalists from the West Coast got in and took it off uh, and took it at a higher number. But 
So yes, it can happen. Yes? So are these the same methods that are used for coronary evaluation? Uh, the same basic methodologies where you get into then, there's a more, little more complicated application of what's called minority interest discount and lack of marketability interest discount. So the, the discount structures are different. The, so on that note, after the investment is finished, right, does that change the valuation uh, for the 409A purposes? Yes. Because yes, okay. that's not reflected in most of these methods, except for the... Correct. Yeah. yeah, yeah, this was the very basic bare bones, but yes, the answer is yes. Any yeah. best practices, I know some founders talk to family and friends early seed rounds, to Right. experience and these methodologies who are basically trusting you right. set terms. Yeah, I think best practice is consult professionals, right? You want you don't want to screw it up, even though you might have the advantage to do that, let's say in a friends and family round, uh, because you know the the weight of uh, the that you know the methodology and so forth is in your in your corner and it, it's not as well understood by unsophisticated family and friends but uh, you know, use, use an advisor to make sure it's setting the value within sort of an appropriate range. Not to say that, you know, we, I, I've seen family members be super generous and I had a situation where they had a royalty right and they kind of waived it and then, you know, their buyout a, a couple years later was at a much lower number even though the company had grown to, you know, a million some odd in revenue from zero. So. Uh, I'd say, you know, go ahead and set the value, you know, more closer to market using professional advice and then if you want to cut a side deal, you know, after they're paid back or something and, you know, do it that way, get, get more free Thanksgiving dinners or something, I, I don't know, but, uh, but yeah, try to be as close really to market even if, if the situation is skewed in your favor.